Let's get joined up. This week's show is sponsored by Bandcamp.com, an online record store and music community where passionate fans discover, connect with and directly support the artists they love. There's thousands of bands and artists on there, including my band, The Rye Dogs, whose second album, Pigs Might Fly, is out right now. Here's a quick snippet of the title track, which is also available on Spotify, Amazon and Apple Music. Because your eyes may be weeping, but your conscience is sleeping. So baby, don't you cry. Your faces are drying and It's totally free to join Bandcamp and as the Rye Dogs are brand new members, we're now looking to grow our fan base. So your support would be greatly appreciated. Just search the Rye Dogs, that's W-R-Y Dogs, and hit the follow button. Right, now we can cue the theme tune. Hello and welcome to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, where a little procrastination can go a long way. I'm Wayne Kelly and it's episode 173 with B. Setton, author of the darkly funny debut Berlin. It's a wide-ranging chat about choosing the right POV, finding your voice and thinking differently about what you think of as success, trying to find joy in the process rather than worrying about the outcome. And that's certainly something that's been on my mind of late with my own work. Um, As regular listeners will be aware, I currently have a book out on submission, but I've been keen to get started with something new in the meantime, partly to take my mind off the rejection and endless waiting, but also just because I wanted to get my teeth into a fresh project. And to be honest, it's been a bit hit and miss, and I've struggled to shake off the shackles of the book that's out on submission. I think I'm overthinking everything and worrying too much about whether what I'm writing is any good, or even if the stuff I'm writing will end up in the finished book. And that's just pointless, and it's a self-destructive frame of mind to be in, and it's not conducive to writing anything decent or enjoying the experience. It's basically a lose-lose situation. (laughs) Um... And during the meeting of my online critique group last week, both myself and another one of the writers was moaning about our lack of focus and drive and general feelings of negativity. And luckily, another group member gave us a good talking to and reminded us that everything can be solved by doing the work. Just keep writing. You know, plot problems, character questions, and anything else, you you know, can usually be solved on the page. Admittedly, sometimes you've got to go the long way around, but I think sometimes you just have to get things going, throw some characters and half-formed ideas together and make stuff happen. That's when you find out if your story's got legs and it's when you discover what you're actually writing about. So after being put in my place by my friend, I started writing again and lo and behold, a new character appeared out of nowhere. New ideas, situations and themes to explore and... Most importantly, now I'm re-energised to push forward with things. As I speak, the first couple of chapters are with my critique group, so I guess this time next week I'll have a better idea if anything I've written shows any promise at all. (laughs) But I'm back in the right headspace and I'm tuned into the wavelength where everything I do, read and see somehow sparks possibilities for the stories I'm working on. And uh, I think that's the best place to be. It's kind of exciting. Uh, But what about you guys? How are you faring? Let me know about that, but also how you're getting on with all your other writing related concerns. Get in touch to tell me what you're up to and feel free to fire questions at me as well. The best way to get in touch is via email, wayne at waynekellywrites.com, but you can also tweet me at jupodcast or drop me a line on the FB page. Also, don't forget to join the email mailing list at joinedupwriting.co.uk. It's totally free and you get a couple of downloadable goodies when you sign up and you'll be the first to find out about upcoming shows and events. Right, let's get to today's interview with B. Setton. So, B was born in France and spent her early years in the Parisian suburbs before moving to the USA to study philosophy. And on graduating, she relocated to Berlin and the city became the inspiration for her debut novel. She currently divides her time between London and Cambridge, where she's studying for a PhD in the anthropology of religion. And she's working on plans for a second book. So Berlin is out right now and available everywhere you can buy books. So enjoy the chat and I'll pop back at the end for a sign off.
Okay, B, thanks for joining me on Joined Up Right In. Really appreciate it. So um, why don't we just start off, just tell us how things are going and give us a sense of where you're actually speaking from at the minute. Um, thank you so much for having me, first of all. It's so exciting no to be here, to be speaking in the capacity of a writer, which is a very new thing. Brilliant, yeah. Um, but it's exciting. I am speaking to you from Cambridge. Um, I am in my first year of a PhD here, um, so that's where I am. Brilliant. And how's the PhD going? What are you, what's your PhD in? So my PhD is in the anthropology of religion. I'm studying religious conversion, which is really interesting. Yeah. Um, the P, it's, and I'm in my first year. So, um, you know, things have been going well, but I am quite distracted by all the stuff happening around <laughs> my novel and writing. I'm very happily distracted, but... I would say in some sense, doing a PhD is quite good if you want to write because you really can manage your own time, which is both a blessing and a curse. But, you know, recently I've been able to focus on my creative work a lot. Um, You know, no one Mm. really minds about that. So that's great. That is good. But you've got a lot of things to think about all at the same time. Yes. Yes. And I'm not a brilliant multitasker. um, You and me me both. (laughs) You and me both. Well, since you mentioned the novel there, why don't you tell us about your debut novel, Berlin? Um, yeah, so it's the first thing I've ever written, um, and I did not um, start writing it with the intention of writing a novel. I was just writing it um, to kind of amuse myself, and I would send it to friends who would just be like, this is so funny. Um, so it was just this kind of distraction, really. Um, but it's a story about a young woman called Daphne who moves to Berlin in search of a fresh start. Um and you know things begin quite well for her in Berlin like she finds a flat in a cool neighborhood she's learning German but then a series of kind of terrifying and violent events um, happen to her and she we we discover that the demons from her past have followed her into a new life Um, that's that's how I describe it (laughs) that's a good way of describing it and do you remember kind of what the jumping off point or the inspiration for the story was I think the setting was at least partly inspired by your own experiences is that right Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, um, you know, so I moved to Berlin um, after I graduated from university, you know, in my early twenties. And I think the jumping off point was a kind of dissatisfaction with what adult life was like, to be completely (laughs) honest. (laughs) Yeah. Like, I don't know if you had this experience, but you know, I, I, when I, as I was growing up, I read a lot of novels and in, in novels, like you read about adults and, um, so it gave me a really sort of specific idea about what it would be like to be a grown up and what adult life would be like. And I, what I really found was basically I was like, adulthood is not as epic as I'd expected. <laughs> I think I'd always thought, you know, I'd, I'd heard from adults, adulthood is hard, yeah. but I thought that it would always be hard in a way that felt meaningful. And what, yeah. what, what I found so hard, we you know, when I was a young adult was like, this is hard and it feels meaningless. And so I think that's sort of, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, so, I was like, I'm going to be, you know, there will be evil, but it will be like Saruman in Lord of the Rings. It's not going to be like, whatever, <laughs> I haven't filled in my taxes properly, you know? And I was yeah. like, I had, I think so the book was really like me trying to come to terms with that disappointment um, and, and, and learn to value life in its own terms and not constantly, you know, see it as something that like, you know, wishing that, it was a different way or um, seeing life as something to be lived up to as opposed to something to be lived. That was something and I struggled sort of with. Get, yeah. Sort of yeah. be in the moment and experience it, take it for what it is. Exactly. It's tough to do that. I still struggle with it, but it was especially tough when I was a young adult. Yeah. Well, that's, what's great about writing though. I suppose you could argue is that you, if, you know, some people write for that very reason to be able to create what you would like it to be or kind of, an, you know, at least partly as a, as a form of escapism. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think there definitely is that dimension. I think for me, you know, I think the challenge of writing has been, you know, to see, I, I don't think I've sort of, so, f- you know, I haven't written anything that's extremely kind of, you know, I haven't written adventure story. I haven't written the kind of incredibly, um, you know, complex sort of far flung thrillers. I think I've tried to kind of write what I'm interested in is like thrillers of the domestic basically and like how can you um see the epic 
in the ordinary. I think that's that's what I've done with my writing more than trying to escape the ordinary, which I do anyway. I think it's more like I'm trying to bring it into focus in a way that I can see its value. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so how did the character of Daphne herself come about? And did you find that you naturally wanted to tell the story in in first person? Because I know to, obviously the book's in first person POV. So, was that just something that happened, or was that a conscious decision? Uh, I mean, I think uh, it, it's it's something that happened organically that I've since kind of found a good reason for. Um, I think I wanted it to be in first person because my my you know, my narrator Daphne um, is a uh, complicated character. She's an unreliable narrator. She's, I th- I hope she's sort of quite sympathetic, but she's also um, quite a sort of infuriating person to spend time with as a reader. <laughs> uh, hopefully sort of positively infuriating. But, um, uh, and, and, you know, for me, it had to be from the first person because it's about a, a young woman who, is a chronic overthinker but who is paradoxically incredibly unself-aware um and so i wanted the reader to sort of see the world through her distorted lens um and to get a sense of like what it was like to live in her head so i think that was why i made it a first person narrator uh the, the inspiration for the character i think came you know a, to confess it came from me <laughs> uh, and yeah. and it came from me, but also, I mean, I would say a lot of my friends um, and uh, I think in some ways I exaggerated, um, you know, some of her qualities, but I, I find what I find really funny about Daphne and I guess about myself and, and, and some of my friends is like, you know, these people who are sort of very analytical and sort of mm-hmm. chronic, they over, you know, I overthink everything. A lot of my friends mm-hmm. overthink everything, but we sort of, lack common sense um and so this sort of obsessive analysis that doesn't lead anywhere is something that is really common and something else that i think is quite common um you know i think like late teens and early 20s are quite a narcissistic age in general oh, i totally agree yeah. right and so i think daphne she sort of set, she really hates herself but she's also totally self-obsessed and it's like that weird paradox of mm. i hate myself but i think of no one else but myself yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and that was something i recognized in myself in, and in a lot of other young people and i kind of wanted to touch upon that you know make it show the darkness of that and also the funny aspect <laughs> yeah. what do you think are the benefit for you anyway what are the benefits and limitations of writing first person I think um, the benefits are that um, you can really, for me, it gives me a greater sense of control of what I reveal and don't reveal to Mm. the reader. Um, And I think when it's from a first person narrative and you're, let's say, withholding information and creating suspense, I think that that sort of it's more bearable for the reader than when it's a second person um Mm. because i think i still have the idea of you know an omniscient narrator as someone who knows everything and therefore Mm. why aren't they immediately revealing it to the reader whereas if you're dealing with an individual in a certain sense it's easy to create suspense because you discover things in lockstep with them i mean Mm. i might be wrong with that i haven't had much experience writing outside of the first person um yeah so I, i'm not entirely sure whether i'm right about you, that but you didn't feel like it it helped were there were there times when you were writing it when you were thinking at any point where you thought oh you know if i could just jump out of this person for this and just see it from this other perspective or i wish i could do this in third person or they can't know that because they haven't been there or they haven't done it or but did you find any limitation from that or in the in the case of this story and this character it just seemed to click and it just seemed to work um, I think I think in this yeah I I didn't have that um, frustration um, I suppose um, you know in a certain sense having it first person it imposed for me a very helpful constraint um, yeah. in in that it limited me to what I could discuss what she could have access to mm-hmm. um, but I, I find like limits when you have kind of endless freedom and you're facing a blank page are really helpful yeah and I think it, a lot of people especially for their debut novel a, a lot of that's that's why a lot of debut novels are in first person I think for that reason whether it's conscious or subconscious I think you're right I think um, 
you know, you, it's kind of, you can sort of simplify things to a certain extent. You can't go off on, well, you can, but it's, it's more difficult to go off on, you know, crazy, complicated, complex, multi-thread stories when you're essentially just telling it from the perspective of one person. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I also think I sort of love having, um, I love, uh, having information withheld for me when I read and then having it, you know, I guess that's just, yeah. and then having yeah. it revealed. Um, yeah. And I think when you have a first person narrator, I found it quite sort of intuitively easy to do that because. You found it easy to lie is what you're saying. Yes, Paul, isn't it? basically. Yeah, <laughs> completely, completely. Whereas I feel like, you know, for me, like, I guess, would you call, they're called third person narrators or omniscient narrators. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's, yeah, there's, there's different ways you can do it. Uh, you yeah. can have like close third person, so you can have, it's third person, but it's often sort of, you've sort of very closely linked to one person. Yeah. So it's, you know, you know, who's from whose perspective it is, but it's told right. in third person, or I you mean, can have like completely omniscient, like you've just said, where it's yeah. literally just hop from one head to the next, to the next, which is, I find really difficult to write. I don't know if you have this experience, but you know, do you, I find sometimes third person, all those forms of third person narration, like I find it harder as a writer to create a sense of intimacy with my characters, which is something that I'm really attached to in writing. And I haven't quite found a way of doing that <laughs> with the third person. Yeah, I know what you mean. I mean, it, it definitely is easier. I mean, what I found in the past is even when uh, I've had things that I've, I've written in third person and they're going to stay in third person, but sometimes to get close to a character as part of the writing process, even though it will never be seen, I'll write something in first person from that person's perspective, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Even if it's, I mean, some people do things like, um, you know, there's things that where people are finding the character where they'll do like a, an interview or something like that with the character, you know, mm -hmm. tell me about your earliest experience of X, Y, and Z. And, you know, you just write it in first person just to kind of get a sense of the character. I've done those kind of things before. And my, the, the novel that I'm subbing at the minute is kind of a weird mix because it's got two point of views, point, point of view characters in it. One of which is first person point of view and the other one is third person mm -hmm close so the third person close in my mind now is it when i'm writing it i i feel like it's almost first person because mm -hmm. it's very close like it's third person but it's written how i would imagine that person to think and speak and um it's just that it's third person that's kind of how i've kind of done the mental gymnastics to kind of make it work for me yeah um, yeah the, that sounds if, tricky if, if i was <laughs> yeah. i think if i was writing multiple I've written things in the past where I've kind of written multiple POVs. They've all been third person close, but each, each, each sort of chapter or whatever that I've done has sort of felt different, hopefully anyway, because, yeah. you know, it's written from the point of view of this character and this one's written from this point of view of the character. But, but I, I think with all these things, I think you can overanalyze it to me with all of this stuff. It's like, if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. Yes, and sometimes absolutely. I find at the beginning of something, I'll try things like I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll often find it, I'll just go off in first person and that seems to work. And then other times I'll have written a little bit and, I'm, and it's not flowing that well. So I'll try it in third person and I'll see which one kind of mm -hmm. works best. But like yeah. you said, I think it's probably best if you don't analyze it too much. Yeah. Then it might break. Yeah. Break the magic. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's fun. It's funny. I mean, I think, um, right now you know Berlin's the first thing I ever wrote kind of the only thing I've written um but now I'm working on a second novel and it's interesting I mean you know I don't want to sort of make a mystical you know say writing is you know a mystical process something like that but it's funny how you you'll start writing a character and you'll you nearly feel like you know they are guiding what is right for them. Oh. So you so you'll write a sentence and then and they will sort of nearly nearly it's a kind of they'll tell you um, this oh, isn't I right. I totally agree, and it's so funny because just today I've I've been writing something new and um, I've had this kind of conversation with one of my other writer friends. I sort of a sort of new character sort of almost just popped up not I sort of knew that they were going to come into the scene but I didn't really know anything about them and as soon as they opened their mouth and they started talking I just knew this person you know and they just and yeah. they started doing something and weirdly because I'm convinced that obviously our phones listen to us and all the rest of it I, 
then immediately found something popped up on my Twitter feed, which was a quote. I think it's supposed to be a quote from William Faulkner. Faulkner, And it says, it begins with a character usually, and once they stand up on their feet and begin to move, all I can do is trot along behind them with a paper and pencil, trying to keep up long enough to put down what they say and do. And I sort of know what he means there. Yeah, um, entirely. That's that's so right. That's so you right. Start going, you're like, well, obviously you come, you you often come up with a plot idea, or you think, oh, that'd be cool if this happens. But then, when you met, even if you try to make it happen, you just find that your character, you don't really know how your characters are going to react until you're writing in the moment. Hundred you know, percent. Well, of yeah. course, they said they were going to say that. Of course, they would do that, or they yeah. or they wouldn't do that. You know, I don't know whether you've had it where you want them to do a specific thing because it's an easy thing for the plot. You're like, well, this will get me from here to here. And then you're like, but I can't do it because that character just would not go along with that or they wouldn't, they'd throw a spanner into the works or whatever. But I think that's when it gets interesting. 100%. That is so true. I've had that and it's like, you're trying to force someone into a corset or something that doesn't fit them. Like, I've had that so much where I'm like, I want you to do this. And then they yeah. totally yeah. rebel, which yeah. is really, I mean, it's very odd. You feel like they have this kind of sentience totally outside of you. Yeah. Which you is, just, yeah. yeah. You just sort of know them. It's, um, it is, it is weird when that, when that happens, but it's also great. It's kind of why we write, isn't it? I oh, think. it's the magic of it. It's completely yeah. the magic of it. Yeah. So are you finding with you, I'm not going to get to you to talk too much about your second book because you're still writing it. And I'm, I'm a big believer in not drinks in these things, but have you, so have you found in terms of, their perspective and stuff have you carried on with the same you're writing in first person still is that still how you're going with it uh yes i am still going with first person um with a very different character um mm. and it was interesting i think i i wrote a lot uh, I, I you know I, I dedicated like two months you know because i'm doing this graduate work and I basically have a lot of freedom about how I organize my work I, I dedicated just two months to the beginning of this novel just working on it like crazy and I wrote a lot um but so much of that isn't really usable because I had to write out the voice of my previous narrator Daphne and yeah. really get that out it's Shake like it getting, off yeah completely it's sort of like getting leftover ink out of a pen yeah. uh, and then and then you come to the new ink and the new voice yeah. um yeah. so that's been the process with that and, and again I'm sticking to I'm sticking to first person. I think a another reason why I'm very attached to first person is because I try and write, uh, you know, hu I try and write with humor. I like dark stories, but I like a kind of dark humor that goes along yeah, with it. And yeah. I find it, there are few, no I mean, probably there are a million examples that uh, will come to mind as soon as I utter the sentence. But <laughs> I think there are a few novels that have third person narration that manage to sort of, write a little bit sarcastically about their characters that don't seem like they're showing them up um yeah. it's hard to write about people's kind of covert behaviors or their mistakes in the third person without seeming like you're sort of exposing them or, or I, I sometimes have the experience of of reading like I feel this about Jonathan Branson. I, I feel like he, he creates characters that he wants to laugh at. <laughs> like, yeah, he doesn't yeah. seem to like his own characters. And, and like, that's one of the reasons I'm and really... And you want them to laugh with them rather than at them. Completely. Um, and so I don't like that sort of, yeah, I think that's quite a tricky thing to do. I mean, I should read more books that manage to do third person narration with, with, with dark humour, but it's quite tricky. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So so what what do you think you've kind of learned in the process of writing that? You, you know Berlin your first book what do you think you've learned from that that you're taking into book two as regards you know what you didn't know before you started and you mean you don't know what you don't know but uh, obviously now you you're on the second book uh, yeah. have there been things about the process or the way that you do it that's 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 changed or refined I think I've um in some ways um it feels like does not feel like a repetition it feels like an entirely different process in some ways um because the first thing that I wrote I was not you know I, as I said I didn't begin it you know it was like I want to write a novel I began it with like I want to write about you know a funny story that has occurred to me or that happened to one of my friends or something or mm -hmm. you know an exaggerated event that happened to someone I know and I want to send it to my friends and so so that you know I was really writing in a in a kind of um 
you know, in, in a context where I had no pressure at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was no expectation. I had no expectation of myself except to sort of delight my friends who, in it, you know, only ever gave me positive feedback. You know, they never mm-hmm. said anything negative. No. Um, and so, you know, going from that to having a book, you know, now I, I got a two book deal, which is amazing and really exciting. But now I'm, I'm writing a book um, that I have to deliver with a, by a certain date. Um, and there's certain expectations of quality. And so I would say this process is quite different. Um, <laughs> what I have, you know, it, it's a sort of different challenge because on the other hand, I had the confidence now of people having read my work and said they liked it. And I think that's such a boost, you know, yeah. writing for people versus writing into the void makes a sure. very big difference. I think the main thing I want to carry over from the experience of writing Berlin into the second novel is, you know, as I said, when I wrote Berlin, I only really showed it to people who were incredibly encouraging and incredibly mm-hmm. supportive, like my mom <laughs> and my best yeah, friend yeah. and, you know, they were kind of my ministering angels of writing. And I really have been doing that with a second novel too, mm-hmm. where I I think at this like delicate incubative stage of writing, you know, I haven't even finished a first draft yet. I only need, I only want positive feedback. Um, and so I really protect myself in terms of the kind of feedback that I dem- uh, ask of people. So I only send it to people who I know will love Just it. Just tell me if you like the font. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Or I'm like, if you don't like it, don't say anything. But but that will <laughs> but upset me. So what yeah, going to say when they're quiet. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. That's terrible. <laughs> no, so I only send it to you know. I send it to like basically like yeah. family or something, and I'm like, have you got time for this? Um, and then they just send me like, love, love this. You know, keep going. And and that's I think that at that what I've time learned, and you you need a cheerleader kind of thing at the early stage. Yeah, completely. And I think I do not really assess my work very critically until I had the security of you know words on the page because it's you know so much easier to to improve something than to write from yeah than to write something new for me um Mm -hmm. and so sometimes you have to you know I wrote about 95,000 words of of the first of this sorry of this second novel Mm -hmm. very very quickly and then I had to I've had to cut about 40 you know, which is quite right. huge yeah. because yeah. it was just bad. But, you know, I needed to write those bad words to get to the good. So, I, you know, that's what I'm carrying over is basically decide when you need critical feedback and decide when you need um, positive feedback. And don't think that you're not like a real writer or being kind of professional enough just because you decide to <laughs> protect your creative process by only asking for positive feedback i think that's like really essential not to be hard on yourself at the beginning yeah and i think again it comes back down to this thing that whatever works for you if that's what you need to get through because you know one of the hardest things is actually finishing a first draft yes you know so many people don't finish a first draft they never get they never get to the end um you know let alone going back and starting the editing and the rewriting and all the rest of it so many people just never reach the end you know they never get to type the words the end on the manuscript so yeah if that's what it takes you to get to to the end of it that first part of it to get you on to the next bit when you can start letting editors and agents and everyone else come in and then rip it to shreds and that's what you need to do yeah I mean I think in general you know I a lot of pe- a lot a lot of people love writing a lot of people write um mm. I think what I've no, I do think that um, writers are too hard on themselves, like very often. And I mm. think, um, you know, I have a lot of friends who kind of, sort of, really critique um, their work at an early stage. And I'm like, I think the beginning needs to be as enjoyable as possible. Yeah. And you know, there is no reason to expect that it should be good as a first draft. Um, yeah. All you can expect is of yourself is that you do it. Um, and I think. For me, that was very liberating to think this does not need to be good, you know. Um, so no, I never and I think, think yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think obviously you're you're doing a PhD, so you've I'm sure you've got experience of this anyway. But I think it's I think it, writing in general, whether you're writing fiction or you're writing nonfiction or you're writing a thesis or anything else, uh, the reality I, th- I think when you I think this is something that you're not really taught at school, you know, before you get into higher education, you're not really taught about this idea of rewriting in general i mean when i think to actually being at school you know you'd write an essay and you'd write an e- you might get told sort of how to construct an essay but i can't ever remember anybody at any point saying 
write a draft of it and then go back and decide on which bits are the strongest parts of it and how you're going to structure it and blah blah that was never that's never taught and i think it's actually really important with any kind of writing um and and i think when people real novice people when they first come to writing um creative writing that they don't even i don't think they have got any kind of idea that you're going to be that you know this whole thing about writing is rewriting i don't i think that's like a complete surprise to a lot of people Completely. you gen- genuinely think everything that they that just comes out of the pen or when they start typing is automatically got to be um you know publishable or um bookshelf uh, worthy or whatever however you want to describe it yeah and um I think I think really it's people not. need to be encouraged to write with zero expectation <laughs> like yeah, for, yeah. you know just I think I think we have um I mean you know there is such a kind of mythology around writing and a mythology around like words on the page and mm. you know uh, all all that that means and I think I think it needs to be sort of ca- made much more casual and people just encouraged to try um without having great expectations of themselves because you know I was interested in writing at school you know sort of you know we like sometimes in English class they would let us have um a creative component a little bit um and I was not doing very well in that at all you know if I had like you know I I didn't I would write stories and I remember like I I would overwrite so dramatically because I I did like language and I liked words yeah I think everybody does that Yeah. yeah and but you know um I never thought I would be able to be a writer because I wasn't very good. And like, you know, many years later, I'm having the opportunity to write, you know, for the public, like for people I don't know. And Mm. so I'd say like, I would really try and kind of uh, lower the stakes when, especially when people are starting out on writing. Um, It's great to, you know, be ambitious and hold yourself to standard, but not, not, not so much that you sort of strangle the creativity out of yourself and kind of live in terror of the page like that's really horrible i agree i think there's nothing wrong with like trying to get better and learn the craft and all the rest of it but the actual expression self-expression part of it um you're right it it can you you can really sort of um stop yourself from expressing yourself if you're not careful and then trying to make it good you can't edit a blank page as the saying goes yeah exactly so you kind of mentioned there about you know when you were younger and you enjoyed writing, although you obviously didn't end up coming to it till a bit later. Do you, can you remember what's your earliest memory of writing or like enjoying writing? How did you kind of come to it? Yeah, I think I, I was definitely, I was definitely, you know, really interested in reading. I was a big reader. I really, I loved, well, when I was little, before I could read, I listened to tapes, um, you know, like Harry mm-hmm. Potter yeah, and yeah. Philip Pullman and that kind of stuff. Um, you know uh cassettes and and then and then I was very into reading um and I remember when I was very young like I grew up in France actually so my my dad is French um mm-hmm. I lived there until I was 18 my mum is English um and I I would read things in English and I would try and translate them into French um mm-hmm. books that I loved so I think yeah. I tried to translate like the first chapter of um Philip Pullman's um Northern Lights yeah. trilogy i can't remember what the first one's called actually um but I, that my first experience was trying to translate things from english into french because i i thought i was sort of doing a public service and <laughs> philip Pullman would be really grateful for my efforts that that was one and then i think the first story i wrote um was about you know a weekend away i'd had and i remember being incredibly proud of describing the sun was like a fried egg and the trees were like broccoli yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like and the wheat was like uh you know sweet corn and I was like oh my Making god me hungry just talking about it yeah I was like that <laughs> that I was like oh that is you know is that an analogy that's an analogy and yeah. I was like or a metaphor I actually don't know yeah. um <laughs> but <laughs> I was incredibly but I was like this is creative revolution what I've done um so I do remember that at about the age of 11. And did then do you remember like when the first person actually told you or gave you a sense that you could actually do it or that liked what you that you'd read because something obviously something from when you were younger to more recently when you decided to start writing what well, you know what you initially thought were just going to be some funny stories or whatever that there must have been something to encourage you 
to do that, to want to do that and to send those things around to your friends and make them laugh or entertain them or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it didn't come out of um, very specific encouragement. I think I I did that at a time, you know, so I moved to Berlin, I graduated from university and I was I was not finding work that I found very stimulating or interesting. I was like waitressing, you know, which I loved for a while. But then after several years of doing that, Mm-hmm. I was kind of I was missing um concentrated I was missing a kind of intellectual concentration you have to concentrate mm-hmm. when you're a waitress but it's a sort of flow state no, of action. I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah and so I missed um I missed that and I think it was out of a kind of intellectual hunger um and that's why I did it I think I, I've actually noticed now um when I want to write I have to create a similar sense of kind of deprivation like I can't read very much I can't I can't be too stimulated by something else, otherwise the need to write goes away. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of someone telling me that I was good, I think it was my mum, to be honest. Like my yeah. mum, I just sent it to her and she was like, this is really good. And I was yeah. like, oh, uh, <laughs> thanks, mom. you know, thank you so much. And, you know, um, my mum is really the person who's been my tastemaker. Like she's shared, she's the one who got me into reading. Mm-hmm. Um and so I trust her taste, you know, I trust her because she'd always given me things I loved. And so her telling me something was good was very, you know, I trusted her and I kept going with it. So, so what, what was your actual path to publication? How did you go from, you know, writing these, what, as you called them, like funny stories for a start and then realizing obviously you were writing a book. How did you get from that to presumably what submitting to an agent or tell me, tell me about that. Yeah. I, so um, I finished the, I finished sort of I kind of finished it it was very the ending was very bad to be honest you know I, mm-hmm. I, I, I the what was good about it was like the voice I was very confident about the voice and the opening and so and then I just sent it to agents completely willy-nilly like I just went on the internet and looked up all these agents <laughs> and I wrote I, I, I made a deal with myself that every single time I got a rejection I would send a another application like a very slow game of ping pong or tennis or something like yeah. every time I got something I sent something back out um I think I applied to about in mo- about 40 agents wow. yeah and, and when you when you were doing that so when do you so your initial tranche or whatever that you sent out how many do you think you sent out in the first go did you just send out a load in the first go like 10 or something or more I think I sent out 20 I literally think <laughs> I sent out 20 it was and it was com- every time you got something back you sent another one out so you could sort of kept topping it up yeah, and then I had another rule that if I didn't hear from them for a month, I counted that as a rejection because <laughs> no one just got, you know, people don't even bother rejecting you. That's the oh, sad I agree, thing. Yeah. This is re- really refreshing to hear, B, this, this approach because, <laughs> yeah, it, because, I, well, what, because I, I, I know, I know there's a lot, you know, it's one of these topics is like that everyone's got an opinion on it and people get very serious about it and oh no you must always make sure you do it like this and should be very selective and uh, and and don't get me wrong I think some of that is true but what's great is for you to just come on here and say well I literally sent all these out and I just kept sending them out and sending them out that's that's refreshing I like it yeah I really was not targeted and then actually recently someone asked me you know has finished like a, a book and they want to send it out and they were sort of sending me the emails they were sending for me to like read over and they were all so specific and I was like do not do not take this much time <laughs> I mean because because like it's so untransparent that I think you just mm-hmm. for me it's a bit like I would just if I was gonna say things I would say like apply to loads of people um because I think we sort of I think the sort of this is another aspect of like mythologizing the the sort of writing and publishing and publication process it's like it's not I don't think the you know, I think a really good lesson might make a difference, but I think it's just a matter of like the right person at the right time who's got a tiny gap in their schedule and you have to, sure. to write something yeah. that fits with something they've been craving recently. Like I think it's distressingly random, yeah. I think, given yeah. that, maximize your chances. Yeah. Yeah. I think you've yeah. got I think you've got <laughs> I think you know, I genuinely think you've got a good point, especially particularly about because I was having this conversation with one of my right friends, because I'm subbing at the minute again um and uh, we were having this conversation about uh you know your cover letter and your synopsis and all the other things that we stress about when we're doing these things but the reality is you know if they don't like that first half a page that they decide to read 
um, of your first chapter or whatever, um, they'll just stop reading and then that's that anyway. So, and if they do, then they'll keep reading and then they'll ask you to send some more or they won't. 100%. Yes. I think that that's it. And I think, you know, I think I've heard from my, a number of agents, maybe I found this out on the internet, maybe my agent told me this, I'm not sure, but that they, they always start with the, um, they don't start with the synopsis, they start with the writing sample. Not yeah. everyone does this, but you know, I'm guessing. Well, I think a lot number. of people do, yeah. Yeah. And then they go to the synopsis just to know where it's going. But it's really, I think it's always like focus on the writing and, you know. <sighs> because you can change yeah. all the, the, the thing with it is anyway is, you know, you can change all the other stuff. Like they can change the plot. They can suggest yeah. changes to, like, as you said, you didn't think your ending was great the first time around. They can, they can easily suggest changes to stuff like that, or they can change the, you know, they can suggest changing the whole thing, like from a story point of view. But if they really like the voice and they really like your writing and they think you could, they can work with you, then, you know, they'll, they'll want to read more and they'll, they'll want to connect with you in some way. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. How long did you, how long would you say this process? So from sending out the first 20 to when you actually landed an agent, how long do you think that was roughly? Uh, so I think um, the first 20, so would that have been, I think that was about six months, which isn't that long, actually. Um, uh-huh. I think relatively, like that's another thing I would say. Um, I think it's sort of, you really have, to, it's, it's horrible because when you've written something, you know, and you love it and you believe in it I think you know you really want to share it with people and that's totally understandable but but I think the the process of getting an agent does not work on your on that faster on that faster schedule and that fast agenda so I think you know six months seemed not long for me I expected it to take like several years I don't know if that's like depressing or comforting I would just say like people who don't get immediate response don't think that it means something mm-hmm. um just well keep- you to be fair from the sounds of it you were only giving them a month to yes. get back to you before you yes. sent another one. Out. Yeah, because I wanted to feel like, you know, I was doing, I wanted to feel like I was doing something for my work, um, which I think is really important. Um, so I'd say, yeah. you know, keep being kind of proactive in terms of reaching out to people, um, but don't don't take like the sort of silence to be meaningful. Because I, I had the silence for six months and then one day it changed and that was great. Um, but so, so, when, so when you were getting... I mean, obviously, as you say, a lot of the time you don't hear anything, which is just, it's frustrating and it's just, it's just how it is, just the sheer amount of submissions that they get. But were you get during that time, were you getting, with some of the rejections that you got, were you getting some feedback for some of the rejections or were there most of them just like form rejections, you know, sorry, this is not for me, but thanks. I got no feedback actually, yeah. Wow. I got zero feedback. I just got form rejections or just people writing back and just saying I'm not taking anything on so right you know just that and that was I loved like when people answered that was nice like, oh I know yeah that's... yeah that's a bonus yeah. <laughs> so that was like a victory for me just getting even getting a rejection because because yeah. they just don't answer I did get feedback so then then what happened is you know so then I worked on it a little bit my agent gave me some feedback and then a year later I got a book deal um yeah nearly exactly a year later um and again uh, my agent submitted it to a lot of places and I got one positive reply and rejected from everyone else. <laughs> so like, <laughs> again, I don't know. I feel like, you know, because when it works out, it makes you seem so successful, but like there were so many non-successes in this process. Um, but I think that I do think, yeah, but I do think that's important to say because I think people are from the outside don't actually realize that that is the case most of the time. Like yes. most people that get published, that is the case. So, so when, so who's your agent now who did pick it up um so my agent is um charlotte seymour mm-hmm. um she is at um oh, oh my god i've forgotten where she johnson alcock sorry she she changed she um, moved yeah, agency, she was yeah. Somewhere else. yeah 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 so so when she, do you remember when you got the email back from charlotte initially yes i remember i remember yeah and what did and what did she say so had you given her was it like three chapters you'd given her and then she asked for the rest or exactly yeah, yeah that happened and that... then she said can we have a coffee to talk about your book um and I was living in Berlin at that time and I just like got uh Ryan F like like the net like <laughs> immediately like even yeah I was so excited Did you, I take it that she didn't realize that at the time no she didn't realize she didn't realize because I think I said I lived in London 
I gave my brother's address because I was like, if they think I'm far away, they won't want to <laughs> Oh, talk. they'll be too difficult to work with, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, and I was so, and then I, I met with her and I was like, I didn't really understand, you know, it was sort of one of those conversations that I had no idea how how it should go. Um, yeah, which I think is fair of most. Yeah. Well, I should imagine everybody that goes through it the first time, that's the thing with it. Yeah. And I think probably because I've spoken to other people like um, SJ Watson, who I've had mm -hmm. on the podcast, but I've, I'm also friends with him now. And he's in a writing group that I'm in. And he had the same sort of thing as you. He got invited. I think it was more or less the same thing come in and chat to me about your book tomorrow or something and so he went in naively thinking oh this is going to be the big you know oh this is going to be the big moment where they're just going to sign a book and all this and it was literally just giving loads and loads of feedback about it but again he didn't he, he only sort of realized when he was there that he he didn't have actually have any idea of what was going to happen he just mm -hmm. kind of got this vague notion of how it might be when why would you because yeah. for most people this is a completely kind of closed shop yes Totally. That was good. Completely. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, in that conversation, I think I, I sort of, I was sort of also very confused about, you know, it's like professional, the professional context is clear to me. Writing was something I did that was personal and, and like the two meeting was very, very odd. Mm -hmm. um, where I was like this person, you know, Charlotte's like amazing, very, very professional. And um, I was sort of like, wow, you know, the book industry was something that you know I, I was so foreign to me um but it was very exciting and then you know at the end of the meeting she said you know I'd love to represent you and I was like oh my god you know it's amazing you, at that point I do you not realized know. you'd been on an interview <laughs> yeah basically basically I think you know probably she just wanted to see that I wouldn't be like too difficult to work with yeah. and I basically was like I have no artistic integrity whatever you want I'll do it <laughs> just take me like, basically but I think the other thing the interest the other interesting thing and I think everybody did this was the something else that I've spoken to writer friends about is is this idea that it, again you sort of felt like you you were on an interview you were being interviewed but technically speaking your agent works for you. you yes. Know, it's the other way around, but it doesn't, doesn't feel like that, especially at the beginning, I should imagine. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I did not feel that at the beginning at all. I, and I was sort of very bewildered by, you know, suddenly um, someone is sort of doing all this work for me and mm. it's amazing. Like, it's such a, that is really a privilege um, and a, an amazing situation to be in it's quite it's quite sort of alien and strange but you know I'm, I'm really grateful for it and enjoying it what sorts of things did you kind of get in that initial feedback so presumably you work with Charlotte editorially first did you before you work with an editor exactly yeah um yeah I mean basically Charlotte sort of agreed with me that you know she basically said she she I think that part of that part of that meeting was for her to see if I was the kind of person who would be willing to work with feedback um which like I think you know it seems very obvious you know especially if you know you're in writing groups and, and you're asking mm. people for feedback but I think a lot of people are quite you know have a sort of artistic idea and a vision of what they want their work to be and are not are very protective of it um mm -hmm. which I kind of understand and admire but I don't think <laughs> is always great if you're collaborating um, I think you've got to yeah. probably choose your battles as well to a certain yes, extent. I think exactly. there's a difference between, you know, holding on to a specific aspect of a character or you being able to justify it. Well, it's like this because of that. But then if you're just not going to take any feedback from anybody, then why ask for critique? Because yes. we've, I've, you know, I've met plenty of people before in previous critique groups and things where you just kind of aware that, doesn't really matter what feedback you give them they're never going to take any of it on board yeah. and you think, I just don't understand why you're in a critique group yes but they're in the wrong place because I mean and I think it's totally fine a lot of people write and want to have full control of the creative process yeah. and, and and that's fine but if you're yeah. writing for other people to read it yeah you know it becomes a more collaborative and democratic process at that stage because it's it's beyond you and it's beyond your enjoyment it's for other people um mm. but I think you know in that first meeting Charlotte just wanted to see you know, is she willing, to, you know, is she willing to kind of work? Is she, has she got any flexibility? And, you know, she said like, your ending really needs work. And I was like, I completely agree. You know, I agreed with all the feedback she gave me, which is that it was a bit, you know, some of it was really overwritten and <laughs> the ending was like, it wasn't really an ending. It was kind of a petering out of energy where I just got sort of tired. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. So. 
but that's that but that just shows you again it's something that we kind of agonize over uh you know that it's got to be absolutely perfect before we even send it out and don't get me wrong obviously you've got to have worked on it and you've got to, you're going to have edited it and all the rest of it but it's not the book that you send to an agent 99.9 percent .9 of the time is not going to be the book that ends up on a bookshelf is it absolutely yeah i think that must be very rare you know maybe some people like get it nail it on the first go but I definitely didn't I mean so there was that process with the agent you know she gave me feedback before she was she felt like it was ready to send out to editors and then there was a huge amount of work with the editor as well um so definitely my book has gone through many many reiterations and transformations as it does for most people what yeah. did, did you, what do you I mean did you find that process did you learn a lot from that whole process do you think uh I think I I mean I I think I oh I mean so you know the, the best thing that came out of that process is that my editor um whose name is Alice Ewell she you know basically gave me the ending of my novel which I was really struggling with mm -hmm. you know and that's another thing that people don't talk about is how how much how many more people stand behind a novel than just the author whose book is yeah. like on the whose name is on the book sorry um yeah you know uh she really helped me and like what I think what I learned I mean I don't know if I learned things you know with regards to like specific things to do with writing I think mm -hmm. I learned I learned um that voice is not what I did learn was that you know voice voice is not enough you need voice has to be complemented by plot however strong the voice of your character is voice and mood is not enough you know like novels require some action and and some I think some kind of transformation or some kind of um, evolution at least. Uh, and, you know, I really helps me understand that. I mean, what, what I think I understood is um, I just, I think I understood, um, you know, basically what I just said, but that, that um, books, you know, we see them and we, we have this image of like one right, one solitary writer behind them. But, you know, my book is like, by this stage, it's kind of a collaborative process. And the best part of it was seeing someone who, connects your idea to the extent that they can get into under the skin of your your characters mm. and you know help you come up with feasibly what they would do and and they nearly sort of know your character in a different way that you do and like for me that was an amazing amazing um process which i really loved and do you think some of that kind of nuts and bolts stuff as regards giving it maybe a bit more shape or drive or whatever you want to call it narrative drive or whatever you want to call it do you think that's something that you will be able to take into the writing of book two. I know you're kind of in that messy first draft yeah. stage, but do you think it will help you with that? I, I think seeing what was hard to fix about my first novel has definitely helped with, with the second novel. So what was hard about my first novel was, as I've said, you know, I had this narrator Daphne. I had a really good, strong sense of her character, her voice. Mm -hmm. I had a good you know, sense of the setting and the mood. So I wanted it to be dark with humour, but I did not have a good sense of a narrative arc at all and it was quite hard to go back into it and to sort of reintroduce Retro the bones yeah exactly yeah. to reintroduce the bones into it you know mm. after the fact was quite difficult um so really what i've learned from that is to be slightly more diligent about plotting um and that's what i've done the second novel and that's been a huge help you know i don't feel like whatever work it will need i don't think it will be like you have to go back and try and give this direction that's a very hard thing to do. It's yeah. So, so that's, that's what I've mainly learned. So as you've um, kind of, I know you're still relatively early on in the process and, and the new book comes out um, shortly, but what do you, what's been the kind of best piece of creative advice you've been given along the way? And that might not necessarily have to be really specific to writing. It might just be something that you've kind of got along the way. It could even be from academia or whatever. Hmm, the best piece of creative advice. Hmm. it's quite I mean there are a number of things I think um if I was going to think of one um it would be you know something that my editor said to me which is basically um what I said you know earlier in the podcast is like make sure you have a team of ministering angels if you can who are supporting you along the way 
um, because the creative process can be very isolating um, and it's very, very good to send out your work and to send it out, not to a kind of like a, a gulf of silence, but to send it to people who will at least say, you know, great number of words you've got on the page, you know, something like that. I think, <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, whether it be through a writing, a formal writing group, you know, or, you know, friends who are willing to read your work, I think that that's been the most important thing. And my editor has been incredibly encouraging about, you know, um, giving me feedback, um, even on just ideas. Um, and I think basically, for me, the creative process is such a balance between isolation and concentration and community and um, sharing ideas. So I think that's been a really helpful thing through this process. Yeah, the whole teamwork thing. Exactly, so yeah. If, if you were starting again tomorrow as a new writer, I mean, you are a new writer, mm -hmm. but, you know, if you were starting your career again tomorrow, is there anything you would do differently about the journey so far? Um. Hmm. I think, I think I, well, I mean, I think I, you know, I made a few, I probably made a few mistakes, um, but, you know, I'm one of these people who's like, well, every mistake was necessary because it got me to this moment of enlightenment now. Um, <laughs> I don't think so. I think that um, in some sense, because I didn't think of myself as a writer for so long, I protected myself from was like a really really good thing um you know people often talk about not having taken their writing seriously with sort of regret but I think it's really important not to take your writing too seriously especially at the beginning mm -hmm. um and so the fact that I didn't really think of myself as a writer was a really a good thing I mean it meant that I didn't devote a huge amount of energy to it for a long time but it also meant that I never felt I was fading at something I had I was supposed to be doing or some you know not being who I was supposed to be. And, and that's, that's really important. Um, yeah. so, so, I mean, on that kind of, kind of on that subject with the rejection side of things, when you were sending out all those submissions and either getting silence or just no, thank you very much. How did you deal? I mean, aside from just keep sending them out, how did you psychologically, how did you deal with that? Were you, did you struggle at any point in time or did, were you pretty much just, well, I'm just going to keep sending them. Was it difficult? Um, yeah, I think actually what I've realized as a writer, as in my experience of being a writer, is I have to balance a kind of, I have to balance modesty, humility with a sort of incredible arrogance. And like that, that's what I did in that process. So, you know, the modesty comes from when you're starting to write, you know, don't have expectations of yourself that it ought to be good. Um, and um, don't put any pressure on yourself because why should it be good? You know, you've never done anything before. You wouldn't mm. like start playing football and think that you should be as good as Messi. So like, mm. why would you like yeah. start writing and think that you should be, you know, Dickens? Like that. So so that that modest that that modesty helped me, and then the arrogance helped me. Um, when I would get rejections, I'd be like, you know, they don't like it, fools. Like yeah. I, didn't, you, I didn't. Well, you've just missed out. Well done. <laughs> exactly. Like I, you know, um, I was very confident about the work um, because I you know, because I loved it and it was true to something that, and it, and it was a story I wanted to tell and it was a, a narrator I wanted to create. And in a sense, I was like, if they don't like that, then I sort of, in a way, didn't take it personally, which is odd because, you know, with my academic work, I, I get incredibly, uh, I get really upset and demotivated if I don't get incredibly positive feedback all the time. <laughs> like, it's a big yeah. problem. But I think I... I really separated the process from the outcome. And, you know, I sort of said, my aim here is not to publish a book. My aim is to tell a story that I want to tell. And I would love to share it with as many people as possible. But because I had achieved that end, this, anything else was sort of a secondary bonus, you know? Yeah. Um, and That's so a great I, way of looking yeah, at it. Yeah, I, I just wasn't very emotionally invested in a certain sense because I tried to sort of see the achievement here is writing a story that I am proud of um of course it's wonderful to get to share it but I am not going to get the pain you know I'm not going to let the pain mm -hmm. of rejection interfere with my love for writing and I yeah I had what, to really work you, on that but. yeah yeah well that's great though what do you do you think 
what do you think you'd have happened if you'd have sent a hundred of those things out and you'd have just got no's and um been ignored what do you do you do you think you know do you think there's a number there somewhere where you would have been like right that's that's it i'm going to put this in a drawer now or i'm going to self-publish or i'm going to yeah I mean, I did have a plan for that, basically, mm-hmm. was I, you know, I was going to print, I was going to make copies and get them like bound and have a friend of mine who's an illustrator make a cover and sort of distribute it to my friends and, you know, anyone I could. Like I was, that was my plan. I was going to have, yeah, you know, I hadn't, I didn't really know about self-publishing that much. Like I wasn't really familiar with that idea. So I, maybe I would have done that. But, you know, in a sense, like I was just like, I want people who, who I want people to read it it doesn't really matter you know they might be my friends there's still people reading my work so that was my plan actually you know and I was already asking I was asking my friends to help me design the cover you know I wanted illustrations in there um so that, yeah. that I sort of I created a goal which I could control that would have given me pleasure and satisfaction um you know I think on the other hand I think if I'd been if I'd been rejected I'm not sure that I would have written the second novel as quickly as I have I because I I, you know I I have the sort of the impetus the urgency of like a deadline but I hope it wouldn't have discouraged me um I think that um I think it's like because I've had so much pressure in my academic work somehow I've been able to protect my whole like writing life um quite well and and that's what I was saying you know um I think writers like probably all creative people but I'm most familiar with writers you really need to protect yourselves in terms of what kind of things you expose yourself to and that also involves like managing your expectation not not in a way that's you know negative and I'm not going to do well anyway but more like you know make sure that you celebrate your achievements in a way that brings you real joy so that you are not dependent on like you know one one agent happening to read your work when they're in a good mood and like that you know you can't depend on that it's so hard to like almost have a backup plan well the, yeah. the, your, your backup thing i suppose was as you say you'd kind of already won because of the way you'd framed it in your mind you'd already won because you'd you'd done what you originally set out to do which was to tell that story exactly and you were happy in a f- way that you were happy with and all the rest and get it onto the page so you'd already won anything else yeah. was just a bonus yeah i mean that that's the thing and i think that's why you know like now I'm gonna start having you know reviews like people who read it or review Berlin um yeah and like obviously there's a side of that that's nerve-wracking but on the other hand I'm you know I'm still I still haven't like my ambition hasn't um sort of expanded to like okay well I want people to love this book and I want it to be a great success like I, I hope it gives people pleasure because because I've loved reading and so I feel like yeah I, I I've been given so much joy from writers that I'm like, I would love to give that to readers just for their sake and to like contribute, you know, cause I've taken so much from that world, reading, 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 and I'd love to get back in writing, but it's amazing that they're even reading it. I'm grateful for their time, even if they hate it, you know, and you know, in the back of my mind, I'm like, I know it's great. So if you hate it, well, that's rock, it. That's you know? it. Yeah. That's, that, that, but that, I think that's a really healthy way to look at it. I, yeah. I've, I, I've had similar things with, I, I'm a, musician and mm-hmm. i play i play gigs and i've had you know i've been doing it a long time and i've definitely had and i do it with another musician and we've definitely had gigs that have let's just say they've not been the best or yeah. people have not really been paying yeah. attention some of those gigs that we've had where it's been three people and they're not really paying attention and they're talking there's been moments where we've kind of looked at each other and gone well i thought that was great so yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> and yeah. so it doesn't matter so i kind of know what you mean or like we really enjoyed it in the moment that was brilliant and so you know if you're not on board with it, then okay, fine. Yeah, completely. <laughs> but as long as you can get yeah. that kind of that, that you say something out of it for yourself, which you obviously have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, and I think um, it's helped that I've never, because I've never thought of myself as a writer really before. I had zero expectations, so any success was was, was you know unexpected and great. And like, I think it's really important for writers to like create um yeah as i've said just have some control over the outcomes um and see anything else that happens as like a completely surprising bonus um you know but there are just like so many brilliant writers and brilliant books out there that just haven't been published yet you know and like that's just because there is a lot of luck involved like it's not purely talent that's very obvious to me because i know a lot of very talented writers who haven't published something yet and i've published before them and i'm like well 
that you know I, I love the work that I've done but it's so much about I got that person in a particular time of her life I was in a particular phase of my life and it worked out for us and, and I'm very lucky but I don't think it means much about the quality of other people's work who haven't been published at all so, so mm-hmm. that because that's what the system's like people have to protect themselves from kind yeah. of you know rejection and stuff from the publishing industry they need to create a little alcove where they can have a happy writing world oh there's a really uh that's a really healthy way of looking at it yeah. so as we kind of um wrap up things can you tell listeners where they can find out about more about you and your work online your social media etc and tell us obviously when the book's out yeah so the book is out on the 14th of july in the uk and then it's going to be out in america but that's next year which is very exciting um oh, but yeah. 14th of july in the uk um so finding out about me i do have instagram now ever since i i have instagram i have to admit i got instagram because Somebody i was publishing a, you yes have it, yeah. i was publishing a book and like <laughs> someone who you know um uh Izzy, who's kind of a sort of press agent, she was like, can you get on social media because you don't exist on the internet? And so I got it for that reason. Um, but, you know, I'm trying to make it a little bit interesting. Uh, so I'm um, at b.seton on Instagram. Um, I'm kind of nowhere else, to be honest. Uh, you know, That's but, okay. Yeah. Mysterious. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> but people can uh, obviously google you and they'll find the find your book online and everywhere else that you can buy books exactly yeah yeah well yeah. good luck with the book i know it's going to be a success and 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 even if it's not it's already a success so yeah. that's 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 the great thing following on from yeah. our conversation but i know it'll be a success anyway but for now b it's been great chatting to you thanks for coming on joined up writing thank you so much for having me it's been a pleasure thank you for listening joined up writing Okay, thanks again to B, and I'll put all of the links in the show notes over at joinedupwriting.co.uk, or you can find it in the podcast description on whatever device you're listening to this on. That's pretty much it for this week, but don't forget to get in touch with all your thoughts on the show, your feedback, and to tell me what's going on in your writing worlds. And you can do that by dropping me an email at wayne at waynekellywrites.com. Also, remember to you can find the entire back catalogue of interviews on the website, and make sure you subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Overcast, YouTube or wherever else you get your podcasts from and that way you can have the podcast downloaded automatically every time. Also remember to leave us a nice rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you're listening to this too because that really helps other people to find the show and recommend it to one of your friends or two of your friends or ten of your friends that'd be even better. So that's it for this week. Thanks for listening. I'm Wayne Kelly. Happy writing, stay safe and I'll see you next time.